So hello, um, thanks for joining us today for this session as part of Net Zero Week 2022. Today we'll be discussing the energy market crisis and what that means for the UK's net zero ambitions. Just a heads up before we start, we are recording the session so we can watch this back and we can share it with anyone that's not here today. Uh, we have a Q&A function that you can see at the bottom. So if you have any questions throughout the session, please type it in the box and we'll try and get to some of the questions at the end. Um, so as part of introductions, I'm Fiona Cormack. I've been within the energy industry now for 13 years, working closely with many of our business customers and hopefully some of you on the line. I'll be hosting today's session. And joining me, we have Rebecca Beresford, Director of Net Zero Strategy and Policy at EDF, and Chris Skidmore, MP, Chair of the Environment All-Party Parliamentary Group. So, as we know, businesses have a vital part to play in supporting Britain to achieve its net zero targets. But at the same time, we understand the energy landscape is more challenging than ever, given the volatility and uncertainty we're seeing in the market. Today, I'll be asking Rebecca and Chris a number of questions about how uh, the energy market conditions are influencing our journey to net zero. So before we start, I'd like the, uh, our guests to introduce themselves. So Rebecca, would you like to go first and also give us a bit of a recap of what's happened over the last year? Absolutely, thank you, Fiona. And hello to everyone who's joined the webinar. So my team at EDF supports all areas of our business in the UK from the generation. You can see a picture there of some uh, guys running a control centre in a what's probably a nuclear power station through to our sales teams leading on energy policy and the longer term company strategy. And that means we're, we're in quite a good position as a team to take a step back from the day to day activity in the industry to really reflect on whether we've got the right kind of resilient and efficient market that will be able to deliver net zero in the future. So to try and uh, get the conversation started and hopefully prompt some questions, I'm going to do a real whistle stop tour, and this is definitely not a, a long PowerPoint tour, a real whistle stop tour of what's been going on in the energy market and the world of energy policy in the last few months. So we should start really by looking at what's been going on with gas and electricity prices. And I'm sure that many of you, most of you might have seen charts like this at various points over the last few months. Um, there's a lot of lines on the charts, so I'll just I'll suggest a couple of things to look at. So the left hand side shows the gas prices in the UK and it shows a number of different products for the gas prices. If you look at the grey line, which is the day ahead price for gas, you can see that from last September or so, day ahead gas prices have been rising sharply and becoming very volatile as well, with significant peaks in December and then again in late February. But the ongoing volatility as well as the absolute level are the striking things. And initially, the effects were more visible in day ahead prices than in the forward curves, by which we mean the, the future dated delivery products that are shown in the, those other coloured lines. But if you look uh, towards the end of 2021, you can start to see that the prices for winter 2022, which are in the dark blue colour, were also rising sharply, implying that the market expected high prices to persist for some time through the winter. And indeed, following that dark blue line up to the more recent period on the right hand side of the chart, you can see that prices for this winter have begun to rise sharply again over the last few weeks. So I'm not going to go into the causes of the gas price rises as these have been well covered by others, but the result in the UK market has been much higher electricity prices because our two gas and electricity prices are linked which means higher prices passed on to all customers, both households and businesses that didn't have long-term fixed price agreements. And we've suddenly seen a huge increase in the amount of political attention, notwithstanding the other non-trivial issues inside government that are unfolding simultaneously, but there has been a, a huge increase in the political attention around energy prices and in turn on energy policy. So, 
unfortunately, uh, moving on to the, the next slide, please. Uh, unfortunately, this has happened at a time when many electricity and gas suppliers to customers simply didn't have the financial resilience and capital adequacy to survive this kind of change to the to the cost base. And we'll all have seen that suppliers have been exiting the market at record levels in the last nine months with millions of customers needing to be placed by Ofgem with a new supplier of last resort just in the last quarter of 2021 alone. Increased energy costs are a major driver to increased inflation. Obviously, that has economy-wide implications. And the level of energy bills has once again been front page news and a political battlefield with prospects of household electricity bills this autumn being 150% higher than they were just 12 months earlier. So I don't mean a 50% increase on last October, literally a 150% increase compared to the price in October 2021 will be what households are potentially facing in October 2022. So the industry regulator Ofgem as well as Bayes and Treasury and you can see that our uh, pictures here are slightly out of date such as the pace of uh, the changing political landscape. Uh, Ofgem and Bayes and Treasury have sprung into action with a series of reasonably rapid in energy policy terms decisions, uh, some of which are uh, listed on this slide. I think it's fair to say that in these decisions there's been a more emphasis on addressing concerns around affordability and ensuring security of supply and less focus on the priority we're discussing here in net zero week, which is decarbonisation. And that's probably understandable under the circumstances. The geopolitical context not least Russia's invasion of Ukraine and associated impacts means that there certainly are risks to the GB energy system being able to guarantee security of supply and that demand will be able to be met in every scenario. And these are things that remain not fully within the control of, of policymakers or regulators or even less so industry participants like, like EDF. But in more positive news, in parallel, there have been longer term, more strategic developments, um, which are on the next slide, please. So if these things that have also been progressing in parallel are implemented successfully, they will be very much positive enablers for net zero and decarbonisation. So to take a couple of examples, in April, Bayes published, without a great deal of warning, it has to be said, a new energy security strategy for Great Britain. And the document sets out the most ambitious view of the scale of future low carbon generation, including offshore wind and new nuclear that we've ever seen. And although it is badged as a strategy, first and foremost, about energy security and energy independence, decarbonisation is positioned firmly as the primary route to achieve those priorities by reducing our dependence on unpredictably priced gas that's been produced elsewhere. And the last one on this list, the rather dryly titled REMA project, is an opportunity for policymakers to review the current multi-layered and rather complicated market arrangements that we have in the wholesale electricity market and consider whether the arrangements are really fit for the future and the best way to achieve net zero at the lowest costs for customers. So overall then, in the longer term energy policy space, we can be confident that decarbonisation and net zero targets are, are very much a priority. Um, just to, I'm very happy to expand on any of those policy developments I've just skipped over uh, in the discussion and questions if it's helpful, but just to finish, um, this is what EDF is continuing to push for to support achievement of net zero. Firstly, you won't be surprised to hear that from our perspective, the low carbon generation, we need to replace existing assets and to meet demand from newly increasing electrified sectors such as transport and heating should be a mix of low carbon technologies, including both new nuclear and large scale renewables. And we were very pleased to hear just this morning that two of our onshore wind projects were successful in being awarded a contract in the latest CFD auction round. In addition, we're encouraging government to show more ambition around energy efficiency 
and recognise that the value of investing in energy efficiency measures in all kinds of properties can start to save customers money on their bills as soon as this coming winter, if we get our act together, and then on an enduring basis into the future. And there's an important conversation to be had about how the costs of achieving a net zero power system are distributed fairly across customers. And this debate has taken on a heightened significance with the rapid increases in energy bills that we've been discussing. It, it can't be right that early adopters of the latest technology are very heavily subsidized and incentivized to do so to the cost of all other customers, including those who might be unable to take advantage of the same opportunities. And overall, we know we need the right infrastructure uh, investment for net zero, uh, which is uh, really quite a substantial challenge, as well as investment in skills and, and R&D. And in order to attract that investment, the market frameworks will need to be long term and as stable as possible, which is not an easy task or an easy ask, particularly of a government that has itself been somewhat unstable in, in recent months. I'm going to stop there. I hope that was a useful tour of uh, recent developments and I look forward to the questions in due course. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Chris, over to you. It'd be great to have a, an introduction and then what your involvement is with the net zero, the UK's net zero ambition. Thank you, Fiona. Well, um, my name is Chris Skidmore, as, as you've mentioned. I'm a chair of the Cross Party All Party Group on the environment in the House of Commons. It's one of the largest uh, cross party uh, groups. Uh, previously, I was energy minister in 2019 and was actually responsible for signing into law the uh, UK's uh, commitment to uh, net zero carbon dioxide emissions by uh, 2050. And I also uh, got across the line our bid for, for COP26, of which uh, net zero commitment. So we became the first G7 country. Uh, beating France by one single day uh, to sign net zero into law was very much part of our, our COP a bit. Uh, I left government in February uh, 2020, but I've been keen to ensure that uh, net zero remains at the top of the uh, UK government's agenda. Uh, so I have established a net zero support group of, of conservative MPs, I should say I'm a conservative uh, member of parliament, uh, in order to ensure and demonstrate uh, the support within the Conservative Party um, for net zero. And obviously, a lot of the prevailing headwinds on the cost of living crisis, I would say a cost of gas crisis, uh, as Rebecca has uh, well demonstrated in her slides, have seen the sort of terms of, of the debate politically uh, shift uh, probably you know, since uh, COP20. Six, and we've seen obviously additionally to that rising cost of, of gas uh, and what that means for households. Uh, fortunately, the UK has been somewhat insulated uh, as a result of the energy price cap that was introduced by the government several years ago. And obviously that is reviewed every six months. We've got the other review taking place in September, October time, which we're going to see the additional prices rise so that the energy price cap has effectively become a, a gas price cap uh, in essence. Uh, but we also now have this new dimension that's reflected in the energy security strategy and the energy security bill that I hope will have its second reading before Parliament uh, breaks recess on the 21st of July, uh, which is around one of sovereignty, understanding that the UK cannot be reliant in the longer term over petro states uh, and potentially for, uh, hostile foreign powers that might hold the UK's energy supply to, to ransom. And obviously we've seen that with Russia and the debate uh, with continental Europe also. So I personally feel that you know, while there may have been a, a step backwards in terms of you know, an increased uh, use of fossil fuels post the pandemic, and we've seen that sort of tick upwards slightly, uh, that actually it's forced the UK government to look at accelerating its progress on renewables, on decarbonisation for the future, Actually, as part of the energy security strategy, we quietly saw actually the government decide to double, for example, their ambitions on the use of hydrogen uh, by 2050, to double the, the uh, amount of carbon that they plan to sequester uh, through their uh, net zero industrial hubs again uh, by 2030. Uh, and so uh, I think it's important to recognize that, as Rebecca said, you know, there is a sort of strong direction of travel towards understanding that you know, renewable energy 
and the opportunity to decarbonize isn't just the right thing to do for the environment. Uh, even if there wasn't a climate crisis, this is a, a transition that we should, we should be making as a country in order to have more homegrown, homeblown energy for the future. And Rebecca touched on the contract for difference uh, announcement that was made today. I mean, it's fantastic that we begin to see some movement on onshore wind as well. You may remember uh, as part of, I think, sort of David Cameron's commitment to so-called cut the green crap back in 2012, 2013, the uh, coalition government introduced a moratorium on onshore wind, which has meant that while the UK has been seen as really a, an international market leader uh, in, in offshore wind, you know, we've seen uh, the establishment of 11 gigawatts of offshore wind power, 1.6 billion pounds currently invested, uh, which has meant also in addition to about 11 gigawatts, that there is another uh, 12 gigawatts coming down uh, the pipeline. Uh, today's announcement is the largest uh, contract for difference uh, auction, which has seen effectively seven gigawatts of power by 2026 uh, being agreed. And that's gonna cover, I think roughly about 12 million homes uh, but the really exciting thing for me is when you look at the strike price on that contract for difference, it's it's 45 pounds per megawatt hour uh, for that energy. That's a quarter of the current price uh, for gas, uh, clearly demonstrating that when it comes to delivering low cost, low affordable energy on the long term to be able to deal with the current economic crisis that's driving a sort of cost of living crisis, that renewables are the way forwards. Unfortunately, there are some in my own party who don't agree with that uh, vision. Uh, so I have determined that you know, we really must need to articulate uh, politically, uh, aside from the sort of policy agenda that's being pursued at the moment, the need to demonstrate popular consent uh, for the net zero sort of transition. Polling has shown that actually for voters within both red wall constituencies, obviously those constituencies that the Conservative Party won off Labour in 2019, and also uh, the so-called blue wall seats, those conservative held seats in the south of England that potentially have Liberal Democrats uh, as the op opposition party in second place. There is a commonality of interest in actually maintaining support for net zero and for demonstrating a commitment uh, to renewable energy for the future uh, if there's to be a successful second Conservative government uh, at when, whatever point the election may take place. And I think for whoever you know, obviously becomes Prime Minister in the next couple of months, for every candidate you know, that will be standing in the leadership contest, I am keen to squeeze out of those candidates a commitment to maintain uh, the net zero um, policy trajectory that has been set quite successfully by Boris Johnson. I was slightly disappointed he didn't mention actually one of the successes of his premiership has been that renewed commitment to net zero and the investment that is needed for it. Uh, I think it would also be you know, a tragedy if the UK was going to lose its international leadership on climate change by rowing backwards, uh, establishing new forms of uh, fossil fuel extraction. When we know that we have a sort of uh, working through of the continental shelf in the North Sea, we fully understand existing oil and gas pipelines are there and will have a managed process by which they will be shut down underneath the net zero transition. But we shouldn't be looking, you know, as the IPCC uh, report recently suggested and the IEA have suggested, you know, we can't achieve a 1.5 degrees pathway if we begin to look at opening up new forms of fossil fuel extraction which is why there was meant to be a decision today on uh, a coking steel, uh, coal uh, mine for, for steel. That seems to have been postponed at the moment. I would hope that whoever is the new leader will also think very carefully about that direction of travel and where we want to go. But overall, I feel that the policy agenda, I am in the majority of uh, Conservative MPs, the Conservative Environment Network you know, works towards maintaining support for net zero. I think it is overwhelmingly a, a USP that the UK government should be proud of in, in, in its commitments. Of course, there are a number of areas of policy where the, there is an ambition gap between what has been suggested that the UK can achieve both by 2030 and 2050 and actually the delivery of that and the timing of the delivery and the regulations that are needed to be able to achieve that delivery, not least in nuclear, where supposedly we're going to have eight new nuclear power stations in, in some states of preparedness by 2030. 
far more detail needs to be set out, I think, in, in trying to understand those pathways uh, for the future. But you know, the priority must be to ensure that the political discourse maintains the trajectory of the policy uh, frameworks that have been set out and that we don't see any backsliding on net zero uh, for the future. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. So should we get on with the questions? So um, our, my first question is, to achieve our net zero ambitions, it's going to be essential for us to decarbonize power supply. What do we need to do to achieve this? And has the energy crisis impacted the progress? I guess this is to both of you, so. So from, from my perspective, I think really that's exactly where Chris, you were, you were finishing at the end of your remarks just there talking about, yeah. um, we've got the right kind of targets and ambitions now. The energy security strategy was very helpful for setting out um, the direction of travel. The challenge now is turning those into implementable um, real projects that are on the ground and actually um, producing decarbonized electricity and and therefore the, the broader system benefits. So that amongst other things that will require some of the potential blockers around that being addressed. There are challenges in some parts of the country around planning, um, planning permission for new low carbon generation. We also need to get on with building, making sure we've got the right transmission and distribution network infrastructure to actually support uh, being able to move the output from these low carbon generators between the places that they are built for good reasons because they have good wind or uh, good water for cooling to actually where they're needed by customers. So certainly there are some um, pieces of policy work that now need we now need to see brought forward in order for us to be able to deliver against those targets that are in the in the energy security strategy. I think we will also need to uh, look carefully at short and longer duration storage technologies. I think that's an important way of maximizing the capability and the contribution of intermittent renewable generation in particular and making sure that we're able to uh, store the energy both to manage short-term peaks and troughs within a day but also potentially to give us that kind of seasonal energy security that as a country we maybe used to have with those great big gas uh, wells that used to exist in in various cities but are now largely empty that kind of long duration storage is not something that we have a, have a great deal of in our market at the moment at a time when it's potentially becoming more important because we will have intermittent renewables to, to manage and cap maximize rather than the flexible fossil fuel power stations of, of the past. Just to echo uh, Rebecca's point, the priority obviously must be to continue to decarbonize our electricity grid as, as we've done so successfully uh, at the moment. That yeah, must be a, a priority around then delivering successful decarbonization elsewhere. Um, and with that comes a real challenge ar around the sustainability of the, future, of the grid and, and the, the loading of that grid. And obviously, Rebecca's mentioned a number of measures that need to be front loaded, I think, in order to ensure that the grid's got the capacity. Uh, and, and potentially, obviously, quite excitingly, looking at local grid mechanisms for delivering on uh, you know, future low carbon homes that might be powered by you know, a single wind turbine, for example. You know, we, I think we, we, have the, we have the pathway in front of us, but we also shouldn't shut ourselves off from potential future uh, innovation as well, which is where you know, I think on the onshore uh, wind potential, uh, you know, we do need to think about how we can demonstrate measures that are going to be, you know, achieve popular consent within the planning process uh, in order to take local people to, with us. As, I, as I've mentioned, you know, we had this sort of apoplectic sort of moment where somehow, uh, you know, in the same way sort of nuclear became sort of incredibly unpopular in Germany, that sort of that was our the onshore wind was the equivalent in the UK. And I think we're beyond that now. But in order to have a sort of effectively a supply side revolution in wind power that we've had it on the onshore uh, side, we need to match that or offshore side, we need to match that with the onshore side 
um, as well. One thing in mean, the question we talked about, obviously, the lessons to be learned from the energy crisis as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for myself, actually, when looking at sort of balancing future demand around uh, decarbonized power, in particular electricity, um, you, the, one of the key things we need to learn the lessons from is obviously ensuring security of supply of materials that we need in order to be able to demonstrate uh, effectively a decarbonized transition. So I know that sort of where he was the minister, Lee Rowley was obviously sort of working on a critical mineral strategy. You look at the US, they're having these same conversations now, Joe Manchin's bill, for example, again, is sort of both focusing on nuclear uh, security of supply, but the, the critical minerals, you know, the critical metals that are needed. I think you know, we need to make sure that we have a, a, a pathway of demonstrating not only how we're going to be able to maintain uh, the, the, the demand that's needed in certain minerals and metals. And obviously, we've seen certain metals sort of skyrocket as well as you know, looking at sort of gas. You know, we've seen cobalt and nickel rise in price as well. And I think that's really important also from a perspective of maintaining support for net zero is it's sort of demonstrating that we've, we've actually ensured that this, this pathway has been safeguarded um, for the future. Brilliant. I think um, you kind of touched on this, both of you, in, in your opening comments, but um, is the current focus on security of supply jeopardising net zero as a priority? Um, I might almost say the opposite, actually, in that um, I think the conversations that we've been forced into having uh, nationally over the last six months because of concerns around security supply, but also affordability, have really given the opportunity to demonstrate that low carbon, non-fossil fuel electricity is the answer for both climate objectives, but also the route to a more stable, predictable, affordable and reliable, homegrown and homeblown, I think you said, Chris, um, energy system for this country. I think where it, where it has potentially risked some jeopardy is in some of the short term interventions that we have already seen um, be made by the government. It's understandable and right that they are focused on short term security of supply and the current situation is, is creating huge challenges for the energy system across Europe and indeed the world and it would be negligent of the government not to be taking steps. Therefore, steps that have been taken that could look as though they're in conflict, like is seeking to encourage coal stations, including EDF's coal station, to run this winter or at least be available to run this winter they're entirely sensible and i don't think they are in conflict as long as those actions are limited to a short-term uh, must-do intervention and that there is a more sustainable exit strategy such that we don't need to rely on those kinds of actions in in future so i don't think i don't think the short-term interventions and the current security supply focus is is incompatible with net zero. If anything, I really hope it's the opposite and that actually this has been an opportunity to accelerate uh, the conversation and the focus on the benefits of decarbonizing the energy system. Uh, for me, when it comes to this focus, you know, Rebecca's right that there has been now a doubling down on, on recognising where we need to um, shore up our energy uh, supply chains uh, for the future across a, a wide range of portfolios. Yeah, I think that's important that we haven't put our eggs in any, any one particular uh, basket. And actually, you know, we could be going further, faster on some areas such as hydrogen. Um, if you look at HiNet, for example, we've seen a sort of doubling of the dark target for, for hydrogen, but actually the uh, industrial decarbonisation and hydrogen uh, supply fund uh, is, is actually still not been uprated to provide uh, you know, infrastructure such as HiNet the opportunity to actually produce the hydrogen they want to produce. So, so actually, there is a sort of problem around uh, the immediate short-term front-loading of some of these projects and capital investments that should be taking place and there's a slight delay I think in terms of actually being able to keep up with the pace. Um, one of the problems I have is, is with is thinking through you know, what Bayes wants to achieve is often driven by a sort of 
effectively a departmental uh, process, um, which doesn't necessarily reflect the uh, enthusiasm and the opportunities that the private sector can provide in order to increase supply. Uh, so you might have, say, for example, you, if you look at those uh, net zero industrial hubs, a number of uh, suppliers wanting to take part, but you know, it's, it's effectively a competition, you have tier one, tier two, and, and there are, you know, this is an international race on a number of these innovations where actually, you know, companies such as Carbon Clean won't, won't set up in the UK, they'll rather they're set up in Canada, because they've been provided with just broad brush uh, tax breaks. Uh, and so I think sort of for us, you know, things are moving incredibly fast now. I mean, if you told me in 2019 that you know, the net UK's net zero target will be adopted by 90% of the world's surface three years later, I simply wouldn't have believed you. But with that rush towards decarbonisation, particularly in the private sector, we risk sort of falling behind and, lo and losing sort of first mover advantage um, for the future. And secondly, the other issue is that the focus on supply, and Rebecca touched on this, has not been matched by a focus on demand. So obviously net zero you know, should be effectively called net zero growth. We're going to be doubling the use of our electricity uh, supply by 2040, I believe, if not 2050. Yet there's not been a, a energy demand strategy that's been set out. Yes, we've had sort of homes and heating strategy. And yes, we have a sort of, you know, uh, again, an establishment of small pots of money, you know, often are then sort of set up. We you know, don't match the, the, the overall sort of demand and then sort of fold. Um, that's sort of choking, I think, the opportunity to really have a, a, a wider uh, supply side revolution when it comes to energy efficiency measures um, for the future. And, you know, we're the poor man of Europe when it comes to looking at our homes. Yes, we've seen the number of homes that have an EPC rating of, of C or above rise from 9% in 2008 to I think about 46% today. But the real problem is all these, sort of, yeah, if you look at eco and the various, again, small government schemes that are set up, they're dependent on having, being funded by green levies, you know, which are 8% uh, of overall energy bills, 24% of electricity bills. That puts them at political risk. You know, it could be that we have candidates in the leadership contest, you know, having some kind of Dutch auction claiming that they want to remove Dutch, you know, the green levies off bills. And I went to see the Chancellor recently to try and argue the case with doubling the capacity on hydrogen for high net and another sort of in, you know, net zero tech T side. But his response was that actually we'll have to increase the green levies. That, you know, that's the wrong financial mechanism by which we've got the tail wagging the dog. And at the moment, you know, risking upfront capital investment for the sake of potentially uh, looking at sort of you know, what, is it, what is popular amongst voters. Uh, and I think we need to, and I said in the Commons uh, the other day on the Bayes Estimates Day debate um, you know, that we have annually, that we've got to create a financial mechanism that reflects the carbon budget mechanism that we have through uh, the Climate Change Act. We don't have that at the moment. So actually our, our financial investment always lags behind on this sort of three-year um, you know, CSR process, when in fact we need to be able to demonstrate the financial commitments that are mirroring the carbon budget process, and we don't have that in the UK at the moment. Thank you. Okay, so I think this one's a bit more for you, Rebecca. So um, can you give us an update on the regulatory progress in the retail market and how the energy crisis has impacted the way Ofgem and Bayes are thinking about future frameworks. Hmm. So I should I should say I have uh, I have no uh, right or role in speaking for Ofgem here, but I can at least share a little bit of insight about our observations as uh, a large supplier to both domestic and non-domestic customers, and the way Ofgem has been engaging with us over the last uh, year or so. So I think. Firstly, I would say that the crisis has given rise to lots of very rapid change. Some of it is uh, potentially things that Ofgem could have acted on sooner and maybe should have acted on sooner. So I mentioned when I was speaking the lack of financial resilience and capital adequacy in participants, suppliers, licensed suppliers in the, in the market that meant that many have not been able to withstand the unexpected volatility and increases in wholesale prices. Ofgem was aware of this lack of resilience, uh, but had not taken steps to really uh, change the situation. They are now 
very much more alive to this issue and there's a much stronger focus on often firstly monitoring and then intervening where there are concerns about the financial strength and resilience of licensees and if you happen to find yourself uh, reading Ofgem's recent publications, you'll see that as an example of that, they've published a number of what they call provisional orders against suppliers where they have concerns about the, the compliance and resilience of market participants. So welcome development, potentially a bit, a bit late. Uh, we've touched on the price cap in uh, the domestic market, very, a very important feature of the regulatory framework that Ofgem places around suppliers in this country, although not as relevant for business customers. But we've seen some reforms to the price cap, that price cap, and I think we will see more in future as well, to reflect, to better reflect actually, the balance of risks being taken by suppliers and customers in the domestic market, because there is no doubt that the design of the price cap had a part to play in why some suppliers found they were unable to continue to operate. And that, that has to be recognized to be a, a problem with the regulation if it's the, the regulations themselves that are uh, driving market participants out of business. And we've seen other regulatory interventions uh, that would frankly have been uh, impossible to imagine a couple of years ago. For example, Ofgem temporarily banning new customer only acquisition tariffs in the residential electricity and gas supply markets, which is a similar intervention to what we've seen recently from other regulators in other industries like insurance. But it's been a feature of the uh, retail energy markets for some time that suppliers were able to offer particular deals through one third party intermediary or another and Ofgem has put a stop to that temporarily as a means of trying to stabilize the market. I think overall, the crisis has brought a stronger recognition both from Ofgem and, as far as I can understand it, also from, from Bayes, that the historic obsession that we had with driving switching rates up and encouraging customers to be constantly comparing tariffs and on their toes and moving from one supplier to the next and to feel that they were doing something wrong if they dared to uh, stay with the same supplier for, for more than one or two years. Um, there's a recognition that that's not the right way to approach the market anymore. And I think that that is a particularly helpful development for net zero and for decarbonisation as well. It will have side benefits, I hope, in terms of the resilience of the, the suppliers. But I think when it comes to building the kind of longer term relationships that we all know that customers will need to have with suppliers offering net zero solutions and innovations to them. Moving away from the idea that you have to constantly be on the move as a, as a customer, I think is, is very helpful and should open the door for innovations from suppliers around decarbonized heating solutions or different forms of uh, products and propositions from customers where there is an expectation of that relationship between suppliers and their customers being on a, a longer term basis. Great, I, I, I guess you've probably answered some of this as well with, with your previous question, but um, what, what more is EDF doing to influence regulation for our customers? Um, our business customers particularly? So I think I probably have touched on quite a, a lot of areas, so mm. I won't dwell too much on it. What I would say is that um, the fact that we are in the position that we're in, having a generation business and a business supply business and a residential supply business mm. makes us uh, able, I hope, to give a more balanced perspective on interventions and poten potential developments in, in policy and regulatory frameworks than some other companies who reasonably enough are focused on one one or other uh, part of the market unlike us so we are actively engaged in policy debates across pretty much the whole range of topics you could imagine from 
low carbon generation, as we've discussed, and energy efficiency and low carbon heating and transport and hydrogen, which Chris has mentioned a couple of times, uh, and storage. And we're in that we're always trying to argue for the for the right long term solutions for the UK and for customers in general. Um, we have been particularly active over the last six months, arguing for more support for struggling customers. And yes, that has been predominantly focused on domestic customers rather than business customers. But we have been highlighting concerns around um, the, the impact of much higher energy bills uh, on business customers and in, encouraging the Treasury to consider whether any interventions might be necessary. And we're also arguing for the regulatory mechanisms like the contracts for difference, which we've mentioned a couple of times, but also the RAB model, which hopefully will be used to um, underpin the funding for future large scale low carbon generation investment, which will attract the kind of private sector investment that we know is needed, but will also crucially protect customers in the long run from large swings and volatility that comes from this exposure to, to gas prices that we've, we've talked about uh, a lot today. And in some of those mechanisms are already delivering benefits to customers. The CFD mechanism is uh, doing exactly what it was intended to do and paying back to customers uh, at the moment, given how much higher the wholesale power prices are than the ones that were assumed and built into the level of the contracts for difference in the first place. So we are very much advocating for mechanisms like that, that will um, be the right outcomes for, for customers and make sure that decarbonisation happens at the lowest cost possible. Well, that leads nicely on to my final question. So um, for businesses that have already invested in net zero solutions, what are some of the benefits um, that you're both seeing? And um, yeah, how, where they've transitioned over, yeah, how can they continue those benefits? Um, shall I go first on this question? Because I think it's, a, it's an important one, uh, again, politically as, as well as for policy speaking, because I think the private sector is now leading uh, when it comes to this debate. And that, you know, even though there are those who are concerned about politically, uh, you know, members of parliament's sort of parties views on net zero like net zero i think is firmly embedded now uh in the private sector and, and it's going nowhere uh the question i think for, for companies is recognizing the opportunities that net zero presents uh, i am always very keen to to demonstrate that net zero is not a cost it's net zero net benefit uh and if not net zero net profit uh, and how you go about demonstrating that sort of pathway framework for decarbonizing your own company uh, that is not obviously greenwashing uh, and not sort of placing investment decisions in the wrong areas of decarbonization. And I think there's a lot of work to be done on ensuring that just a company saying it's going to go net zero, it maintains a clear and transparent pathway towards net zero uh, that often eradicates uh, carbon dioxide across its life cycle. Uh, it isn't necessarily looking at predominantly uptaking the use of offsets without looking very closely, obviously, uh, yeah, that, the entirety of a business uh, on how on reducing emissions to start with. There's huge reputational opportunities. Obviously, with it comes reputational risks if it's not done properly. But then also, I think there's a real opportunity for net zero and decarbonisation you know, as a uh, process uh, to, that allows companies to to embrace disruptive thinking, to be able to find further efficiencies uh, within their business and ultimately drive up productivity. And I think there must be some work that can be done working with business and industry and demonstrating the returns on productivity through decarbonisation. You know, we have a productivity crisis in the UK. We have had you know, since 2008, 2009, we've not you know, recovered uh, in, in demonstrating uh, productivity in our workforce and in the private sector. And so I think that this provides a, a moment, a, a green industrial revolution, that even if climate change and the climate crisis wasn't happening, this is the moment for companies to demonstrate you know, their own security of supply, their own opportunity to be able to be not just first mover market uh, leaders, but at the same time to reinvestigate you know, all their processes, all their supply chains, 
and understand whether you know, actually the, they're doing the right thing, not just for the environment, but the right thing actually economically for themselves. And I think we've crossed that barrier now where you know, someone like Mark Carney and, and others have come out and said, this is not just the right things to do for the environment, this is the right things to do economically as well. And I think you know, companies need to embrace that if they haven't done already. And for those that have embraced it, they need to make sure that they are uh, you know, clearly articulating, uh, working um, you know, within the company, with their workforce. Yeah, and I think also being embracing uh, decarbonisation at every level. Uh, I think that there's a risk sometimes this is seen as sort of a, a vertical within a company, whereas you know, demonstrating across sector, across the workforce, you know, across every skill level, demonstrating that you're embedding skills, green skills within the company, you know, it, it, it is, I think, having a, a tremendous impact. And it's a wonderful thing for the company, not only to be able to sell, but then to also be able to demonstrate to their customers that their customers have that opportunity you know, to recognize that they are decarbonizing their, their own lifestyles and by you know, going with that company. So Rebecca's point, obviously, around switching, you know, it used to be on price. People now are moving with their feet when it comes to actually wanting to do the best uh, for the planet as well as what's best for their wallet. I'm not sure I've got a great deal to add to that answer, except just from a really uh, simplistic perspective, that if there were any sceptics uh, around previously about the case and the benefits of investing either in uh, decarbonized energy, whether that's on-site renewable generation or, or corporate PPA structure or investment in new machinery that is more energy efficient or new insulation for your business premises. If nothing else, the, the very high wholesale energy prices that that will have avoided exposure to over the last few months, I hope will have convinced uh, any skeptics that there were, that it really is, as, as Chris says, it's, it's the right thing to do, not only environmentally, but also economically, and that the payback time for some of these changes can be really quite short um, if, you, if you do it at the right time. <laughs> Thanks very much. That's all of our questions from this side. So we have had a few come through the chat. Don't know if you've both managed to keep an eye on it. Yes, while, while you're having a look, Fiona, um, Chris, you, you made a reference to greenwashing earlier, and I can see there's a question in the chat from Jason uh, about the Rego system, and I guess that prompts a, a, a broader thought from me about all of this uh, wonderful opportunity that we can see for businesses to um, make the most of their transition to decarbonized energy solutions, we need to make very sure that we do have a transparent and clear and consistent way of reporting that kind of information, because it would be, I think it would be quite possible to see a divergence in approaches that actually risks undermining the good intent, because potentially consumers lose lose faith and lose trust uh, in all of these low carbon claims that they see coming at them from suppliers in all kinds of directions. Uh, what, what's your perspective on that risk? Um, well, I think my perspective is that we have obviously, you know, a, a national conversation around companies that wish to sort of set out sort of their decarbonisation strategies, but equally at the same time, the, the, the whole debate around potential uh, trading of carbon is moving very fast. You know, the great takeaway, I think, from the um, Glasgow Climate Pact was obviously the completion of the rule book, uh, understanding that we have Article 6 you know, now in place. And, and so I think there'll be opportunities for organisations to look at new forms of uh, offsetting, you know, that actually work through Article 6 and through uh, emissions, you know, not only emissions trading, but carbon trading for the future. And that's potentially, I think, sort of very uh, you know, exciting, but we've got, to, and, and obviously Glasgow talked about creating obviously an international accountable body that is going to be able to be really looking to regulate this as well. So it's still quite unclear about sort of where we'll be in the next sort of year or so. Um, and then I think the discussions around the EU CBAM and the vote that happened yesterday 
demonstrate sort of you know what are the standards going to be uh, is obviously there's everyone sort of waiting uh, you know, to, to really sort of understand what the frameworks which then they'll be able to operate and I think you know in the past you know we had a sort of self-policing mechanism by which obviously some sort of policing mechanisms were seen as more authoritative than others and you know, I would recommend personally that you know, the science-based target approach is, is the must be the sort of way which you know the, the, the things that companies take forward some of their offsetting approaches but that aside once you have the regulatory and uh, international agreements sort of in place and potentially accountable organizations you know, you know that, that, that is whether we like it or not that will be the regulatory structure and so therefore um you know this whole new conversation about then what's acceptable what's not acceptable but we obviously working within that means you know that that process uh it, it will then become sort of the, the new norm i think it's a it's a very interesting space and there's a uh there's a decision to be had about the extent to which we as a country want to be at the forefront of developing those international standards rather than being a, a taker of them after the event, I think. Yeah, and I think uh, sort of you know, whether there is an argument for sort of a, a differentiation or whether we'll, we'll want to uh, adopt the whole, this, some of those standards whole scale, whether we'll just sort of look to uh, gold plate, the sort of the EU templates. I, I expect in, in terms of the need to establish something rapidly that you know, we will do. Um, obviously, the question is, um, you know, is there any opportunity for, for the UK to do things differently? Um, and so that, that in itself requires quite a lot of cross-sectoral effort. And I think you know, what we've seen, particularly on the hard to abate industries, that might be a sort of opportunity you know, to, to look at actually how we can um, you know, achieve international cooperations on a horizontal level. Then you've got mission possible partnership, uh, mission innovation. You know, the, the UK that is the home of mission possible partnership. Um, and I think, you know, as as with what we've seen in decarbonisation uh, in the UK, uh, let's let's focus on some of the sectors where you know we know it's going to be difficult. Uh, that actually the challenge is that we, we've got to be able to see what we can do and what we can't do. And you know, when it comes to shipping, whether it comes to uh, cement and concrete, whether it comes to steel, once we've established what we can't do properly, and there's, you know, the, the frustration is there's still a lot of innovation going taking place, which is going to establish what we can do, but what we can't do. But let's be very firm then about sort of actually identifying you know, where is it best to, to offset that sort of, or, or purchase that sort of carbon emission or pay the price for that carbon. Great. I've, I've, I think going through the questions, we've we've covered a lot of them. Um, but um, can we uh, just pick up one here? Are there any expectations or thoughts on how the energy crisis might have affected energy use for our customers' behaviour? So over this recent period, um, and therefore, like, what does that look like in the short and long term? So I think, uh, well. The data is coming in thick and fast uh, on a daily basis about how in practice it's uh, the higher energy prices and perhaps concerns about energy security might impact customer behavior. I suppose all else being equal, I'm hopeful uh, that it will drive positive consideration of things like energy efficiency and I'm hopeful, particularly if we can see some government advocacy for increased focus on energy efficiency, that that has the potential to really make a difference uh, for, for customers of all kinds. And as I said earlier, pretty quickly, if we if we get our act together, um, obviously. There is a there is a genuine worry that for a number of uh, customers, the levels of energy bills that they will be facing this winter will be simply unaffordable. And it would be naive to sit here and, and suggest that this is, a, this is a good news story for decarbonisation whilst not recognising that for millions of households across the country, the absolute level of energy bills will be such that some households are having to make very difficult decisions. And particularly when it gets the winter, we'll be making very difficult decisions about whether to turn their heating on at all or whether to buy some food for their children etc um, and that's a desperately worrying situation and we've got to keep a, 
we've got to keep a very careful eye on that to make sure that where there are undesirable impacts on customer behavior that we're ready to support those customers both as an energy supplier but also encouraging policymakers to to step in and provide that support um, as indeed we have seen come forward already oh i think it's a uh, there was another linked question in there in terms of uh, whether or not there's, this is an opportunity for a springboard into uh, energy efficiency. And I hope I've made the point clearly that I, I really hope it will be. Um, we'll have to see. I think it's going to make some a, a fascinating study to explore um, how the data is, how, what the data can tell us about how customer behaviour has changed. If we look ahead just a little bit further to a world where we might be encouraging customers to engage with their energy on a price that varies at different times of the day and actually giving customers opportunity to save money where they have opportunities to shift their demand around which again will very much help our decarbonisation and net zero objectives as well as being able to help customers. I think this, this experience that we're seeing now could provide us with some useful insight about how effective um, those kinds of products and propositions might be in future. Brilliant, thank you. Well, I think we're at time. Chris, have you got anything else you'd like to add at the end before we? I think probably the one thing is is, is that we do need to take a, you know the government's obviously going to provide further support. I imagine you know it's four hundred pounds per household. That's eleven point six billion pounds that was gone out the door in terms of providing additional support on uh, energy and heating bills. But there was no conditionality placed on that. And you know, the argument I would make is that actually. If the insulation was put in place, that's four hundred pounds every year that is being saved on those bills, and that we also need, I think, to, you know, when it comes to looking at sort of you know, usage of uh, heat and energy, it's all on heating and, and air source forms of energy. We haven't really done much on on, on heat, hot water, and I think that we, we we probably do need to sort of take a step back and think, you know, what are the the uses in the household of of energy, uh, electricity and gas. And, and where can we provide you know, a, a overwhelming sort of a package of support that's not just financial, but also it you know, instructs the householder on how they can reduce those costs by making quite simple measures of you know, using their existing boiler, you know, not just around the thermostat, there are other measures they can take uh, in order to actually uh, reduce the, the long term uh, use of energy within the systems they have at the moment. Brilliant, thank you. Well, thank you both. It's been a really interesting discussion. It's gone very quick. Um, and thank you for all the questions. If we haven't managed to answer your question today and you'd still like an answer, please reach out to us. Um, you can get more information from our website or you can get in touch with us via the Let's Talk Power mailbox. Also, we're all available on LinkedIn. Um, again, thank you for joining. Thank you to Chris and Rebecca. I hope you found that all really interesting. And, and like I said, there will be a recording if you want to listen back. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.